Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Tonight, we'll be talking with a good friend of mine, a fellow Jesuit, and a former student of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, and take a look at his thoughts on Western culture and the ethical foundations of the law. Before we get to that, we are joined on our set by Jack Williams, who is the general manager of EWTN Radio, to give us an update on what they are doing over there. Jack. Father Mitch, how are you? Fine as we just here. We just finished some radio over there. Yeah, we did some radio this afternoon. It was very And that good. was a lot of fun. But the fun doesn't stop when I go off the no, air. Y'all keep on It working. may not be quite as fun, but it doesn't stop altogether <laughs> when, you, when you leave over there. You know, uh, as you're well aware, the network, uh, when the whole uh, COVID-19 situation started to blossom, uh, the network was inundated with people looking for spiritual support mm -hmm. uh, in our programming. Mm -hmm. And in response to that, uh, over on the radio side, we revamped our EWTN Radio Classics lineup to reflect what people were asking for. Sure. And we're continuing that, and we will continue that until we get back to something a little close to what we would consider uh, normal. So you can see the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Every other hour on EWTN Radio Essentials, which is how we have rebranded EWTN Radio Classics for the time being, mm -hmm. every other hour from 8 a.m. Eastern Time until 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And in between, there are all sorts of devotionals, the Rosary, uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Uh, you'll hear uh, encouraging messages from some of your EWTN favorites, like Mother Angelica mm -hmm. and Father Benedict Groeschel uh, and the like. You can check all of that out at EWTN Radio Essentials. And in addition to that, we've started a brand new program uh, earlier, I think, in the fall of last year, we debuted a TV program with Kristalina Evert called Women Made New, and they have taken a podcast now, and we've uh, rolled that into a brand new radio show on Saturdays by the same title, Women Made New, where Kristalina will interview prominent women in the Catholic world and get their take on uh, you know, basically what it means to be a Catholic woman in our society. So folks can hear that at noon Eastern time every Saturday, uh, Kristalina. So things may be grinding to a halt in some uh, areas of our society, but not at EWTN Radio. We keep pushing forward. Yeah, and how can somebody get the EWTN essentials? They can go to EWTN.com slash radio. Mm -hmm. EWTN.com slash radio, and you'll find the Essentials channel for you to listen to there. You can also find it on the EWTN app, okay. which everybody should download on their phone. It's absolutely How much does that cost? It is free. The low, low price of nothing. And you can have the EWTN app. And you there's know, that pictures of you my, all over it. That would have put my dad, the used car salesman, out of business. It would have. But I like it. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. Thanks Thank for you, that Father update. Mitch. And... We are going to be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Thank you, and welcome back. Our guest tonight has a very long relationship with Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, starting back as a doctoral student of then Professor Joseph Ratzinger in the early 1970s. 
And it was also the theological ideas of Joseph Ratzinger, as well as other distinguished Catholic theologians of the 20th century, that pushed him to make their works available to English-speaking readers through the advent of the publishing house known as Ignatius Press. And he's here tonight to discuss a series of essays written by Pope Emeritus Benedict before he became Pope, and one written after his retirement. All of it was compiled into a book called Western Culture Today and Tomorrow. So, please welcome our guest, the founder and editor of Ignatius Press, Father Joseph Fessio of the Society of Jesus. Father Fessio, how are you? I'm well, Father Pacwa. Thanks for inviting me on the show. We haven't talked for a while. I know. Uh, this is great. We're social distancing. Uh, we're about 3,000 miles apart, so I think uh, we're probably okay. And I want to say that uh, I want to thank you and EWDN for proposing how we got to the point that we discussed this book because it forced me to reread it. I spent my life reading manuscripts and books, so often I haven't reread things for a while. But as I reread this book, Father Pacwa, uh, it, it, it could have been written yesterday. I mean, it, okay. it, it was. I found this on the uh, web for this book, Father Pacwa. Oh. <laughs> Check it out. You know, Father Pacwa, your technical person told me to turn off my phone, which I did. Yeah. I must have said something which sounded like, sounded like, hey, Siri, in this book. And so my phone is telling me where to get this book. <laughs> it's not part of the app. Anyway, yes. I, I well, so much know. for the phone. Stick with me. Yeah. Stick with me okay. here. Okay. <laughs> I'm with you. So also, you, it was good. You mentioned this is a series of essays or talks also. Yes. Uh, Colonel Ratzinger, Professor Ratzinger, Paul Benick, wrote very few books. Uh, there are a few, mm -hmm. but most of them are collections of articles or essays or homilies or speeches. Uh, but they, they come together on a single topic uh, from a different number of perspectives. And this really gives us the background on how we got to where we are as a culture and what are the chances of going forward and maintaining all the good characteristics of what we've received from Athens, Greece, and Rome. Uh, in the wonderful inter uh, forward by uh, George Weigel, uh, he emphasizes that, that our culture, Europe, by the way, Europe has extended, you know, north uh, to Russia and then east all the way past the Urals, and then through the discovery of the Americas, you know, west to the, the Americas, uh, north, central, and south. And so we are all... Uh, to some extent, tributary to a European culture. And, and, and let, let me just say this so that folks understand the context, that uh, Pope Benedict was talking about a Mediterranean culture that was dominated by Rome and Greece, and that Greece right. and Rome ran the show, and then... Christianity entered into that world, but through barbarian invasions from the north, and then in the uh, seventh century, uh, Muslim invasions from the southeast, that half of that world was lost to the Greco-Roman Christian world, but the fo you're talking about now, the focus moved north to the barbarian German tribes and to the Slavic tribes, also pretty barbarian, and eventually... Oh, no, not the Slavs, not the Slavs for the part. Uh, yeah, the I, Poles, I wouldn't push... The Poles, the Poles might... barbarians, we know that. Yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> we, we had our moments. Uh, but, but it moved all the way to uh, east to Siberia, in, which is in Asia, but 
it's still a European culture, and then west to the two Americas. That's right. And he says on page 18, he says, Europe is not a continent that can be comprehended neatly in geographical right. terms. Right. Rather, it is a cultural and historical com uh, concept. So yes. that's right. Uh, and But what, what does that have to do with us today? Uh, I mean, I think it's important. The beautiful thing about this, Father Pack, was you know from Pope Benedict and Carl Resser, he always goes down to the roots of things. Yes. He goes down to things where, where we can all agree on something and then tries to draw the consequences. So for us living in the 21st century, this is a very great overview of what has led to us being who we are, what's positive about it, what's negative about it, and what we can do to preserve the positive. And one of the things that is key to understanding Joseph Ratzinger's mentality is that he survived Nazi Germany when he was a, a te young teenage boy. And then he, as a professor in the, in the late 60s, he experienced the student rebellion that was not only in America, but also in Europe. And it was a shock to him. And he has considered what happens when there is the breakdown of this unity between Greek reason and Roman law and order and Christian religious perspective. This, this seems to be his, you know, the, the thought that, you know, keeps him moving forward to understand the depth of this. And that's, I think, as we're, right. we're going through another yeah, 50 exactly. years later, another such crisis. Exactly, because you have, in uh, 1968, he was at Tübingen, as you say, during the revol revolutions in Europe. And I was in France at that time, Paris, they had the barricades up. And nothing looks to me more like 1968 than 2020. Yes. I mean, we're seeing the same thing now. It's a rejection of our past, a rejection of our culture, a rejection of faith, a rejection of Christianity. That's what's happening. And I a mean, rejection of European culture. I, one of the things going down with the toppling of not only statues of Confederate generals and leaders, um, yes, and, and I made a, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, that that's partly a, a cleansing of the memory that that's being done to forget that. But it's also constant attack on European colonizers. The, the, the recently yesterday, the chant was "Death to the colonizers," and it's yes. the the people that bring European culture. And the question is, is European culture? the problem, or is not this rebellion something that comes from Europeans? Most of these people are, are white that are doing all this writing. Is this not a manifestation of the underbelly of European culture when it goes bad? I think you're absolutely right, and that's why this book is important. It really helps us get the principles to understand what's happening. But as you say, you're in Alabama, all right? And so, okay, in the South, some people want to have a Confederate flag or a statue of Lee or a statue of Fort Bragg. And, uh, you know, people topple the statues. But what happened next? They toppled the statue of U.S. Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, without Grant, there would be no emancipation. Right. Lincoln was great, but Grant won the war. Yep. Uh, then, th then they take down the statue of Junipero Serra here in California, uh, who did what? Who protected the Indians from the depredations that were taking place. But then, how about this? They topple the statue of Cervantes. Cervantes. What's wrong with Cervantes? Well, he's white. He's European. He's a male. He was a slave, by the way. He was enslaved by the Muslims for quite some time before he was ransomed. Uh, and so this is not a rejection of uh, simple racism in America. This is a rejection of a culture they believe is founded on racism, the famous or infamous 1619 project of the New York Times that America is based on racism. Mm -hmm. And so they want to destroy 
everything which reminds them of the history of this country because it was a colony. It was, it was, it was, it was inhabited by colonizers. But the point is, what do they want to put in this place? Well, see, and this is not only the problem of 2020, it was the problem of 1789 France. It was the problem of 1933 Germany. The problem of 1917 Russia. Over and over again, what do they bring in its place? And it always ends up a catastrophe, a catastrophe. And we already have seen in Seattle that people have been killed and they won't even let the EMTs come and help them. So there's catastrophic uh, beginnings already in these movements. Well, just yesterday in Ventura, California, which was founded by Junipero Serra, St. Junipero Serra, uh, the, these wonderful Catholic parishioners came out. They knew there was going to be an attack on the statue of Junipero Serra. So they surrounded it peacefully. Uh, as the protesters, so-called peaceful protesters, came with uh, armed and with, uh, you know, almost a sword, uh, they called 911. And what was the response they get? Oh, the police have said, uh, if you don't feel safe, leave the area. What? We're trying to protect our property. We're yeah. trying to protect our heritage. We're trying to protect the statue of a saint. Oh, if you don't feel safe, leave the area. Fortunately, the police did show up. They were a few blocks away. And when things got pretty dicey, uh, one of the Catholic defenders of the statue went down to the squad car. They drove a little closer, and then they put their siren on and their lights on, and the crowd pretty much calmed down. But you want to defund the police? Wow, move to Minnesota and see what's like what it's like when they burn your house down or you burn your business down. Well, this but this gets at a, a, a question then, you know, uh, that that Pope uh, Benedict, Pope Emeritus Benedict, is dealing with. He he points out these three centers of European culture. One is Jerusalem. Why does he bring up Jerusalem? Because, of course, the Greeks understood in their highest culture that there was a god who was not one of the gods of Mount Olympus, uh, but it was basically the logos, reason, understanding the world from the point of view of experience uh, and rational you know, investigation, mm -hmm. and that was good, but that's kind of man seeking God, and you might get to justice from that, but you won't get to charity. Uh, Rome, of course, brought law and order and architecture and good roads and so on. But the Hebrews, the Jews, and then Christ himself brought us what? Brought us God speaking to us and brought us the Sermon on the Mount and brought us the rule of love as well as the rule of justice. And without charity, there will be no justice. That is, And, and Benedict made that clear in his first and second law on Deus Caritas Est. Mm -hmm. So... You can't, as as uh, George Weigel said, I think the introduction or maybe somewhere else, that we got this three-legged stool of, you know, Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem. You take off one leg and the stool's going to wobble. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what does, <laughs> what does Jerusalem bring us? It brings us God. It brings us grace. It but brings us the Savior. But one of the other points that Pope Benedict brings up is that it also is about the exodus, that sense of being on a journey that, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not just here to make a, uh, a perfect society in stasis. They just sort of stand still. You get perfection, then you're done. But rather, God has us keep moving, and that is a very key, another key component of Western culture, this sense of being on the adventure, and as life comes along, you get involved in this adventure all the more. Exactly, and of course, what Jerusalem brought to the world uh, was history, because in both the Eastern philosophies, India and China, mm -hmm. and even in Greek 
philosophy prior to Christianity, you had this secular view of history, that eternal return. Right. When Nietzsche went back to the Greeks, he also went back to eternal return. But no, Christianity, he, Jew, Judaism and Christianity said, no, God has entered into the history vertically. It's no longer just a circle for going somewhere. However, that has led to a false idea of progress. I want to point something out. It's on page 79 in this book, okay? Uh, he talks about uh, the myths of the day, and he says at the top of the page, I would say that nowadays three values are predominant in the general consciousness, yet their mythical oversimplification at the same time poses a threat to moral reasoning today. These three values that are constantly mythically oversimplified are progress, science, and freedom. All those three concepts have really come to us through Western civilization. Progress, uh, as you mentioned, history, as it's seen from the Jewish and Christian perspective, science, logos of the Jews, and freedom. The ancient world was a world which was enslaved. There were slaves everywhere. It only began to be uh, dis, you know, uh, dis, disaggregated or, or, or re removed under Christian auspices. Yeah, but it's it's important to note that once Christianity be got you know was made legal, you know Constantine legalized Christianity and undid Nero's decree that Christianity was illegal. Once that happened, saints like Saint John Chrysostom began pushing for the liberation of the slaves. And the papacy became a force to liberate slaves all over the Christian area. And once the Atlantic slave trade began, it was only the Vatican that kept the, the popes taught repeatedly every, at two, three times a century that there's an automatic excommunication for engaging in the slave trade. That this was right. automatically, you're out of the sacraments from that point on. And this was part of our heritage. And that has to do with slavery. You're absolutely right. But there's another element which people often don't realize, that in the ancient world, the wife was the possession of the husband. Yes. He had yes. power of life and death over his wife. What was it that changed that? With Christianity, a woman had the right to become a virgin, remain a virgin, or become a nun, which was protected. And that's what emancipated women, that the church said women are human beings with individual rights. They do not have to follow the dictates of their father or of their husband. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, you, you want to have women's liberation, you better thank the Catholic Church, because that's where it started. Now, there's, there's the second uh, uh, leg of the stool, or the three-legged stool, is Athens. And by that, Pope Benedict is referring to the use of reason, that Greek philosophy rejected the principle that you could contradict yourself. That, you, that, that the principle of non-contradiction became a starting point for Aristotle's logic and all logic. And that really determines the mentality of European culture throughout the, the world that you cannot contradict yourself and call yourself a philosopher, a thinker, or logical. Exactly right. But here is what was the weakness of that, is that it was the real, realization that God was not just pure will, as it is with Islam, that whatever mm -hmm. is right is because God says it's right, not because it's right in itself, but the idea of logos, reason, and that led to a flowering of culture in the West. It led to philosophy, it led to science. What happened with science? 
science began to be more natural science, physical sciences became more and more focused on empirical observation, experiment, and so we kind of narrowed our view of what science is. Mm -hmm. And so what Ratzinger says in this book, in many places elsewhere, mm -hmm. and he also said in his famous speech on September 12, 2006, at Regensburg, which got him into trouble, that uh, Western knowledge has been reduced to scientific knowledge, and therefore the moral component has been obscured. Mm -hmm. But we have real knowledge, real logos, real human understanding and intellect must be open to the transcendent. And if it's yeah. not open to the transcendent, then you risk pure secularism. And that's where, I mean, Ratzinger sees the good in the French Revolution, and the good, of course, in the Greek logos, but he's saying we, we cannot deny the scope of reason extending beyond empirical experience. It goes beyond that. Yeah. So that's the one thing. Well, and again, thinking of his own lived experience in Nazi Germany, where scientists, medical doctors, lawyers were the ones who were in charge of the concentration camps and did absolutely immoral experiments on human beings, experiments that we would not tolerate on animals, yet alone on human beings. And they used a, a false understanding of Darwin to promote you know, eugenics and this super race and all that. They use, misused science separated from morality and God's transcendence to do this horrible e evil, which in retrospect, we're shocked. But we can't forget that Cardinal Ratzinger and, and Joseph Ratzinger grew up in a world where that had become acceptable according to the state. The government made yes. that. And so he talks therefore about these three values that are real values but are mythologized of progress, science, and freedom. And he says in all three cases, but they've been oversimplified, the Catholic Church through faith, which enlightens reason, has got to in inject or reintegrate into them the moral criteria. So for example, in progress, not everything we can do, should we do? Uh, the, and when we have uh, developments and so on, we've got we've got to look at those in terms of how they affect man, how they affect our planet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good thing too. So we, we can't just say, oh, because we can do it, therefore let's try it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when it comes to science, as you just said, uh, if science loses the moral, its moral bearings, then we can experiment on people, we can try fetuses, you know, we can uh, we can try and create human lives in a test tube. All these things, we've lost the moral compass there. And finally, when it comes to freedom, uh, it has to have the rich tradition of Catholic and Western moral you know, thinking there that uh, freedom does not simply mean you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt someone else directly. No, freedom means the faculty we have for doing what is right and what is good and what is true and what is beautiful. That's what freedom means. Mm -hmm. But it, we... The, our culture, our culture needs the faith in order to let it not shrink into these atrophied versions of progress, of science, and of freedom. Well, let's go to the third leg of the stool, which is Rome. And by this, he's talking about the development of the Roman civilization uh, began as a tribal society and moved through monarchy to uh, elected monarchy but still monarchy to a republic and then kept on refining the republic and dealing with the various power plays that would take away people's rights freedom, economic base, and so on, and that 
Rome is both a legal authority where law guides the society, but it's also one where people are dealing with the needs to improve the society. And they had their ups and downs, to be sure, but they were struggling to deal with that. And this also characterizes the West with its rule of law and the ongoing development of uh, civil society and governments. That's right also. And it's interesting he points out in this book, uh, which is kind of common knowledge, but we forget it, is that when the emperor moved from Rome to Constantinople mm -hmm. uh, during the Christian period, mm -hmm. uh, we had in Constantinople, since the emperor was there, he was both the emperor, the, the, the temporal ruler, and he was the head of the church in Byzantium, in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Whereas because the emperor had left Rome, the bishop of Rome, the pope, was in charge of the spiritual order, but he was not in charge of the temporal order. So it was because of that that we had this uh, separation of church and state, yep. which they didn't have in the East. And okay. that has also led to this very healthy tension between church, I say healthy tension because it, it, there, there's some conflict there, but we have laid the foundations for the autonomy of civil order uh, and the autonomy of the spiritual order, which he didn't have in the East. But that's a beautiful thing we have. I mean, look at Islam now. Uh, it's, it's, it's a state, it's a religion, it's all in one. You, you can't, okay. there's no escape from that. Yeah, you, you cannot, in Islam, you cannot distinguish secular from sacred. Everything that occurs, occurs by the direct will of God. And there's no distinction between state and religion, between secular and sacred. They, and it's not just at the high levels of thought. Your average Muslim also understands that. And, that. and they point out to me, when I'm over in the Middle East, that that distinction between secular and religious doesn't exist in their culture. We recognize that. And again, it's a tension, but we have to recognize it. Now, something else I have to recognize is that we need to take a break, but we'll come back in a couple of minutes and continue this discussion about the basis of our culture, and then talk a bit, I'd like you to address a bit, Father Fessio, what would Pope Benedict say we must do in the face of this cultural crisis, and what is the role of the average Christian in dealing with these crises? So please stay with us, we'll be right back. Right, we are speaking with Father Joseph Fessio, uh, fellow Jesuit uh, out in California, who is the founder of Ignatius Press. And Ignatius Press has put out this book, a uh, collection of essays and talks by uh, Joseph Rossinger, <coughs> who is, of course, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. The book is called Western Culture Today 
and tomorrow. And we've been addressing what the Pope sees as the basis historically. And I, I urge people to read this book so that they can see in a more complete way how the Pope lays out this view of the origins of our culture mm -hmm. in the faith of Israel and the push of the Exodus, the love of God, in the reasoning of Greece and in the government orderliness and structure and rule of law from Rome and how all three intertwine to make a whole culture. I urge you to read that. But one of the things that he also talks about in this book, and I'd like you to, to develop this further, Father Fessio, is he talks about our role as people who bring peace into culture. And we're seeing a lack of peace and a pulling apart of the culture. How do we do that? How do we be sources of peace? in this culture. Let me back up a step, uh, sure. Father Pacwa. Sure. Uh, because he he sees that, and this is going to answer your question. It's not it's yeah. not a Jesuit evasion. Uh, he <laughs> he uh, he sees the French Revolution as the third turning point in Western culture. Yep. Uh, and he says on page twenty nine, for the very first time in history a purely secular state arose yes. in the world, a purely secular state. And then he talks about two views of what the future might hold, one by Oswald Spengler and one by Arnold Toynbee. Mm -hmm. And Oswald right. Spengler had the, the negative view, like a biological view, that every culture has a beginning, you know, it's born, it, it grows, adolescence, it matures, it gets old, and it dies. Uh, and therefore, Western culture is going to die like all the other cultures have. Uh, Toynbee had a more voluntaristic view. If we, if we want to change it, we can. We don't have to succumb to that. But, of course, Benedict's question was, well, what can we do? What can we do? Now, we've talked about creative minorities before. And, in fact, in another book he's done, uh, and I forget the title, it was 50 years ago. We published it. It's something like, oh, I forget. Anyway, it has about the future of the church. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he's very circumspect because he's not a prophet. He doesn't know the future. But he says, if we can judge by what's happened in the past, uh, the future of the church will be not as much institutional influence as we had in the past, but we'll have to have uh, intense creative minorities, those who really voluntarily, intentionally accept the faith. But they will be there for the rest of the culture when it collapses as it must. Okay, so that... His general idea is that we have to be faithful in kind of a uh, uh, and keep ourselves in a community that can nurture our faith. Mm -hmm. And then there's two more things I want to say about that. One is this has to do on page 101, uh, where he talks about there's pathologies of reason and there's pathologies of religion. But he says on 101 at the top. Religion must continually allow itself to be purified and structured by reason. That is to say, we can't just be superstitious. Right. But he also said, this is why reason, too, must be warned to keep within its proper limits, and it must learn a willingness to listen to the great religious tradition of mankind. So number the first answer to the question, Father Pacwa, is that we have to allow for this dialogue between reason, science, you know, political science, and so on, and religious tradition, faith. But the second thing, and this he says on page 155 towards the end, interesting commentary. He says, uh, in the old church, the catechumenate, which is where people lived and were trained as they prepared to become Catholics, was created as a living space set apart from an increasingly demoralized culture. The Roman culture was was declining, was becoming more and more immoral, more violent. We must set apart an increasingly demoralized uh, a space 
a space in which that distinctive innovation of the Christian way of life was practiced and at the same time protected from the common mode of living. Here's a key sentence. I think that even today, something like catechumenal communities are needed so that Christian life with all its character can hold its own ground. So how do we do that, Father Pacwa? Well, EWTN, you created a community. I mean, it's a wonderful thing over these years. Yeah. By the way, EWTN is, is, is contemporary with Ignatius Press. Yes, that's uh, right. And, and I was with Mother Angelica when she founded it. We talked about it. Uh, but at a time when we had bishops who were weak uh, and sometimes misleading people, Mother Angelica through EWTN went over the bishop's head, over the priest's head, into the living room. And that helped maintain the faith in this country. It was kind of a virtual community before that word even came up, you know. Secondly, we've got things like homeschooling. It's a, it's a huge movement in the United States, but parents want to create an atmosphere not to remove their children from the world, but to give them a formation while they're children so they can go out in the world armed to be able to love, be compassionate, but also speak the truth in love. That, that That's important. So I think the answer, Father Pacwa, is to do what you're doing, what we're doing here at Ignatius Press, what many families are doing. And, you know, around the world, the church is often in decline, especially Europe. In Africa, it's not. But I think in America, we have a very, very healthy Catholic community. And the, the main reason is not because of you and me, priests and religious, it's because of a lady. Yeah. Catholics who are willing to have children, Catholics who put the children's faith education first and their formation, Catholics who have blogs, Catholics who put together magazines and run schools. I mean, really, I think we have a vibrant Catholic community, but we're surrounded by a culture, a cancel culture, and they want to cancel our whole heritage tradition. We've got to uphold the richest, you know, most vibrant parts of that, which the Catholic Church is the center of, yeah. my view. No, I. But it's also it's also right. <laughs> as your view is always considered, <laughs> particularly by you. <laughs> but one of the things that, again, Pope Benedict brings out here too, is, along that same line, the role of monasticism, he doesn't develop it enough, uh, there's only so much space, but monasticism was precisely that in the, the as the Roman Empire in the West was fighting and losing to hold on to what it had. And as the barbarians were coming in from all over and attacking, it was the Irish monks who preserved whatever was in the Ro Roman literature as well as other literature. They were studying Coptic, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and preserving this, and then reseeding Europe in the sense of putting the seeds of faith and knowledge in their monasteries all over Europe. And it was these small communities, exactly as you say, that became the basis of new cities after the chaos of barbarians. And well, this is a model for us today to be faithful to Christ, to his church, the sacraments, and become those communities that Jesus our Lord centers on himself. And yes. then we go forward. Yes, Father Pacwa, as Cardinal, now Saint John Henry Newman pointed out in his essays on Benedict education, in the year 1200, uh, when Europe had a population of about 250 million, which is less than the U.S., there were 40,000 Benedictine monasteries in Europe, 40,000, not monks, 40,000 monasteries. Mm -hmm. That's like having 1,000 in every state. Can you imagine 1,000 monasteries in Alabama? Yeah. But I yeah. said years and years ago, I said homeschooling is the monastery movement of the new dark ages. Homeschools are the monasteries of the new dark ages. Yeah. I, you know, but there's more than homeschools. I agree. Uh, before we, we, time is running out, I want to say one thing about this, 
Father Pacwa. Uh, in the epilogue, he talks about he yep. wrote this as Pope just just in 2019, so it was it's quite recent. He talked about what the origins were of the uh, sexual abuse crisis in the United States, and on page 148, he summarizes it. He says, uh, "I try to show that in the 1960s." A colossal event took place that in its scale was practically unprecedented, unprecedented history. One could say that in 20 years from 1960 to 1980, the normative standards on sexuality that it held up to that point collapsed entirely. So a collapse of sexual morality. And then he goes on to say, at the very same time, there was a collapse of the church's moral theology, both in seminaries, in universities, and in general teaching. And this is what was at the origin of the sexual abuse crisis. So it, it's a, but I think he puts a finger on it. It's not, it's not a few priests who happen to be, uh, you know, uh, perverts or whatever. It's rather that they were fostered in the environment they had because of a society which has lost its belief in or its acceptance of Christian moral standards. Mm -hmm. I, I think when you, when he points to 68, what would you say were the key events of 68 that led to that collapse? Well, in 60, uh, the collapse came, I think, before 68, but that was when St. Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae right. as a response to the sexual revolution, and there was a rejection on, of that by Catholic theologians and many other Catholic intellectuals. Yep, yep. It, it's, uh, I, I think, and what's key, I, I'll never forget a few years after that, well, actually, it, it was in the uh, uh, mid-1980s, because I was already a professor uh, at Loyola in Chicago, when um, the, the theologian who had led the charge against Humanae Vitae, Father Charles Curran, a priest of the uh, Diocese of uh, Rochester, New York, I believe. And Father Curran had led that charge, and years later, he admitted on 2020, a very public format, that there is no moral problem with uh, a, even adultery, sex before marriage, uh, in some, case, some cases adultery, in some cases abortion, yet alone birth control. And I think the key that existed was he was able to isolate love from procreation, that once you say, well, sexuality is primarily about love and not procreation, and if procreation gets in the way, you can end it. That destroyed the unity of human sexuality. And one of the great ironies of that era, a lot of folks don't realize, but my statistics are from the Center for Disease Control. When you look at the sales of uh, various contraceptives, the pill and other forms, that the, as the sales increased in the 1970s, it's a very steep increase of sales. The increase of abortion follows the same curve. The increase of sexually transmitted diseases follows that curve. And the increase of outer wedlock birth follows exactly the same curve. The more that people were using birth control, the more outer wedlock birth, the more abortions, and the more sexual diseases there were. And the reason for it was people called it safe sex, and it wasn't, and they did not see how strongly our sexuality is oriented towards procreation. And they made that divorce 
but it, it just led to catastrophe. Yes, and once you separate uh, unity and procreation, love and bringing children to birth, well, there's no reason that you can oppose something like homosexuality nope. or same-sex unions and so on, yep. uh, and then divorce. I mean, almost all the sexual problems of our time, especially the diseases, as you mentioned, are a result of a rejection of the church's teachings. Yep. Thank God the church is one to stand firm in the midst of a society which has lost its mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we see, you know, that so many of the other problems that flow from the breakdown of family. Uh, when you, I always like to point out to folks, when you and I were born, you were born in the 40s, right? 41. Yeah, it's a I was, great year. Yeah, v wonderful year. And <laughs> I was born in 49. I like that year too. But Oh, you're a young kid. Uh, no. <laughs> but in <laughs> in the 40s, 4% of children were born out of wedlock. Today, in our lifetime, it's now over 50%, more than half of all children. That breakdown of family in other areas and increased poverty, all that comes from rejecting of the church. And I think that Pope Benedict has his finger on the pulse of how that breakdown started with that divorce between procreation and love. And it's, it's not gotten better yeah. since. And you, you check the prison population of the day, including the very large percentage of blacks who were in there. Yep. Well, why? Uh, they hardly any of them have any fathers. No, it's it's a fatherless society. As a matter of fact, it's, the family. It's eighty yeah. percent to eighty-five percent of all inmates, not only here but in Europe and elsewhere. But Father Fescio, we've run out of time. Okay, too bad. I know it. But will you join okay. me in giving good, and extending good a to you. Would you extend a blessing with me to our viewers? May Almighty keep God up. bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Fessio, you good work. thank you. You do the same. And right. again, get Western culture today and tomorrow by Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger. And get it at EWTN religious catalog or EWTNRC.com is item number 3166. And please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll keep bringing you Father Fessio and many other wonderful guests to talk about all of these issues of our church and our culture today. God bless you and thank you.